This segment is about projections and sections and why they're useful in the context of nonlinear dynamics. Both of these are strategies for reducing dimension, taking very high dimensional state spaces and reducing that dimension to something that we can understand while still preserving the meaning of the object that you're working with. The challenge, of course, is how to chop down the number of dimensions while preserving meaning. So, how to think about these things. A projection is like an x-ray, and a section is like a CAT scan. On an x-ray, everything between the beam and the film interacts with the photon as it travels down that path all the different bones and organs and skin and things like that. So all of those things leave their impression on that photon, and so all of the stuff in that part, in that slice of your body, gets squashed flat onto the film. A CAT scan, in contrast, takes individual slices of a body. In fact, the T in CAT scan comes from tomography, and tomos is the Greek word for to slice. You might think of a projection of a three-dimensional thing down onto a plane. Now, we often do that to depict objects on pieces of paper or computer screens, which are 2D. This is a picture of a 3D to 2D projection. You could also imagine projecting this object down to one dimension, as if you were looking at this image from the right-hand side of the screen, edge on. So that's what a projection is. Again, sections are like CAT scans. They take slices of an object. Generally, sections are one dimension less than the object, just like in the hospital, where they produce a bunch of two-dimensional slices of three-dimensional U for the doctor to look at. If you're working with a complicated attractor in a high-dimensional state space, it can be very hard to tell what's going on. And projections don't help much in this situation, since the projection operation pushes things together that shouldn't be together. And that will create those crossings that I said were illegal in the kinds of dynamical systems that we study in this course. In math language, by the way, a projection is a transformation that, if you do it more than once, doesn't change things beyond what it did the first time. This business about projections and crossings is going to come back in the next two units in a big way. The reason is because those units are about the analysis of time series data, most of which is scalar. That is, measurements of one thing. That's exactly the same thing as squashing this attractor onto one of its axes if you only measure one of those state variables. So projections will come back. But in the meantime, we're going to focus on sections for the rest of this segment. Why are they useful? Back to this picture. This trajectory looks like a rat's nest to me, although there are some hints of structure. If you perform a section, however, the structure pops right out. When we use this kind of section in nonlinear dynamics, by the way, we often call it a Poincaré section, after Henri Poincaré, who I consider the grandfather of the field. Lorentz, I consider the father of the field. Your mileage may vary. Okay, how to construct these sections. We talk about a plane of section as the slicing surface, and often we call that plane capital sigma. Points on the section, like this red point right here, exist where the trajectory pierces that plane, and only there. By the way, the computer algorithms for doing this are very similar to those used in computer graphics to determine when a ray of light or a bullet hits a piece of a polygon. Those pictures that I showed you in the last unit from Lorentz's computational chaos paper were spatial sections, by the way. The full attractor here looks like a bagel. And this trajectory is a slice through that bagel, like so. There's another way to construct sections, by slicing in time rather than space. What I mean by that is that you shine a strobe light on your trajectory, and you only plot the points that get illuminated. Imagine, for example, a strobe light in a dance club. You see people's positions every tenth of a second or half a second or whatever. Let's do a thought experiment. Imagine you have a pendulum that's rotating over the top once every second. That's what one hertz means. And you have the strobe light set to flash once per second. You'd see the pendulum frozen in space. If you turned the strobe frequency up to two hertz, that is, you were flashing it twice per second, you would see two copies of the pendulum. If you turned the strobe frequency up to three hertz and you were flashing the strobe three times as fast as it took the pendulum to go around, you would see three copies of the pendulum. The really interesting thought experiment is the one at the bottom. What if the pendulum's frequency and the strobe's frequency were not rationally related? 
Let's consider the case where the strobe's frequency is just a tiny bit faster than the pendulum's frequency. If the pendulum were here when the strobe flashed for the first time, it would go most of the way around, but it wouldn't quite get all the way there. So the next time the strobe flashed, it would be there. And the next time the strobe flashed, it would be here, and so on and so forth. Another interesting thought experiment. The act of sectioning with a strobe light, which is how I actually constructed this section that I showed you a couple minutes ago, discretizes time, right? because it's only showing you points every tenth of a second, or every twentieth of a second, or every second. It's turning a flow into a map. This system is actually the driven pendulum that I showed you in a movie several units ago, and I have the strobe light hooked up to flash once per drive period. You probably remember from that movie that we had a way to change that drive period, and that doing so induced bifurcations in the dynamics. Here's what those bifurcations look like on a temporal Poincaré section. With the full trajectory, you couldn't see this very well because there's just so much going on. But the act of sectioning the trajectory reduces that information and allows you to see that there have been topological changes in the attractor. For example, between the bottom two plots, you could imagine kind of bending the left one into the right one. And in so doing, you wouldn't have to make any trajectories cross each other. You wouldn't be making new holes or new pieces or making holes or pieces go away. That is, you can go from the bottom left plot to the bottom right plot in a manner that preserves the topology of that structure. And topology is going to come back also in a big way in the next unit. But if you look at the two plots in the left-hand column, it would be very hard to imagine deforming the top left one into the bottom left one and having that process be smooth and not destroy any of the connections or holes in the structure. Just to wrap up, Sections and projections both reduce the dimensionality of an object, but they do it in fundamentally different ways. Dimensional reduction is critical when we're confronted with objects, with sets, with trajectories that are in higher dimensions than we can make sense of, or that our computer algorithms can make sense of efficiently. You'll see an algorithm in the next segment of this course that uses Poincaré sections to get some traction on a hard problem.